Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel. This is for ROI Club members. Uh, some premium content here today on the deep dive. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, Blackstone Minerals is a really, really interesting company. One I, I really like the look of. I'm going to show you what I think, how much I'm willing to pay for it, and what I expect to make uh, out of Blackstone Minerals. Disclaimer, nothing I say is advice. You know that. Don't be stupid. Do your own due diligence. This is me sharing my thoughts with the world, just my opinion, what I'm doing may or may not be right and may or may not be right for you, two or three or four very different permutations. Alrighty, guys. So uh, if you're not already a member of the Mav Live, uh, I humbly suggest that you check it out and uh, you can test it out for free, seven day or 10 day free trial, whatever it is on Substack. The point is... Uh, this allows me to run effectively a, a purely online um, trading business. Uh, it's very lucrative. We're up uh, about 12% uh, since inception, which was the 1st of August this year. Uh, just check it out, guys. Uh, with a free trial, you've got nothing to lose. It will show you how I use uh, good value opportunities, uh, in my opinion, such as Blackstone, and how I really get the juice out of that um, by selling or trading. Uh, monthly through to uh, even weekly at times options. So done uh, well so far. The members seem to be really happy with it. Uh, so if you're not a member, uh, I do suggest that you check it out. Now, let's take a review uh, so far of the stocks mentioned with uh, members on Z channel. Okay, so we're um, yeah coming up a year now uh, since I decided to make this little um, uh, little side side group, and I'm really enjoying it. So. Um, it's not updated as of currently because Whitehaven Coal is like a dollar higher uh, than that. Uh, these stocks have done really well. I'm really happy. And what can I say? Dividend adjusted performance is closer to 400% now over a year um, of the names that have been mentioned. So that's that. Um, yeah, <laughs> not to know what else to say. So far, so good. Uh, we're getting into a really tricky environment now. You would have noticed a lot of um, producers or direct plays on uh, themes that I've mentioned many, many times. This is a royalty play, and I'm starting to look more and more and more and more towards these types of plays because I I am a little nervous as to this, maybe not so much the last quarter of 20, we're in 2023 as I'm recording this, uh, but certainly 2024, I think has some real uh, real headwinds ahead of it. I'm amazed at the the current strength of the, uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ. Um, I don't understand it fundamentally and I don't like it and I don't want to be anywhere near it. This type of business, however, is one in which I do want to be uh, a part of. So Blackstone Minerals have uh, a whole heap of interest in nat gas, oil uh, and land uh, leases. They've got a hell of a lot of acreage, uh, which will be of the utmost importance uh, over the next decade, I think, uh, in terms of what's happening geopolitically in the world and the ability to get oil uh, from good sources, uh, you know, good quality oil uh, and gas, of course, in a friendly jurisdiction. And I think that, I think that people are not putting a, enough of a premium on that. So it's basically a royalty code the way it operates now. And I'm going to show you why that's important. So here's Blackstone. It looks like it chops in a sideway drain for a long period of time. And it has done that over the last year. When I see that, I think of uh, a couple of things. So I think how much of the float is public uh, with such a, a high quality business like this, this is a good thing. Uh, there's not as much of the float is public and it's taken up mainly by the uh, the management of the business. And that's exactly what you want. The second thing I think of is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. What I can do is if I like the business within at any point of this range, I can sell some options on that or buy and sell options on that. And it just really juices up the, the performance from an income perspective. So we're getting towards the higher end of the range recently with oil spiking up. What do I want to say about this? Dividend yield currently a tick under double digits. I think you'd be pretty close to, uh, to hedge in a double digit at the moment. Um, Payout ratios pays out about uh, three quarters of the earnings. And so for an income perspective, um, that's what you want. That is uh, and should be sustainable for a very, very long period of time. Why? Because they have basically no expenses and uh, being the, the royalty type model. And that's uh, extremely important. Now it's a royalty type model, but take a look at the next 12 months price to earnings. It's not a good measure of... Um, you know, valuation for these types of companies. I get it. I agree with that. Um, 
But if you want to use even, even, I mean, 10% uh, earnings yield, 12 and a bit, call it nearly 12 and a half um, EBITDA yield uh, to enterprise value for a royalty company that is massive and has massive interests um, in my favorite commodity. I think the, the most important commodity right now, which is oil. In addition to which they get a free kicker on natural gas and they get a free call option on the undeveloped acreage. Look at the margins on this thing, 90% margins, return on assets, return on equity, return on invested capital. I mean, return on invested capital, 46%. That's very, very good. Very, very good. And if you're a student of Charlie Munger, all else being equal in a, a business like this, your long-term return on your investment will be close to, if not equal to the return on invested capital, return on equity of the business. So um, yeah, personally, I just think this is a mistake in terms of management. I just believe, uh, not management, excuse me, uh, the analysts are just, they've swallowed the Kool-Aid around this idea that we're heading into recession and apparently everything's just going to drop off the face of the earth. We may, I believe also, yes, we will go into a recession, but um, something like this doesn't really have to worry about that because think about what are their cash outflows? They're, they're de minimis. And so they, they, they offer a, a high exposure to upside revenue. They'll tick away in the medium to downturn and you know the, the bad times. And they will just don't have that cash uh, outlay, generally speaking. So since 2016, here, uh, all I wanted to really point out is the relationship uh, between uh, the cash from operations, net income, and what that really means um, in terms of management's efficiency and this uh, business model in which they run. So you can see, obviously, that's grown a hell of a lot. And... Um, you'll see the cash flow, the free cash flow looks low because they pay out those dividends. Um, and that is, you know, obviously you can see here, uh, I think 2022 is a wonderful example of how closely bunched these things are. So of their EBIT, how much of that uh, became net income, okay, uh, which is a good indicator of profitability. And you can see here that the net income under gap principles, generally accepted accounting principles, is actually higher than the EBIT. And that has to do with interest expenses and a few other, other things, but they're very, very close. So in other words, when you sell something, uh, they've got rights on revenue. So their revenues, their cost of goods sold are basically nothing. And it all, and then you've got your EBIT, uh, the way a financial statement works, the income statement. And from there, it basically all drops to the bottom line. Really, really wonderful set of circumstances. And uh, my uncle Rick Rule would say, your gross is your net. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And the blue line and the pink line, I think, are probably the best uh, to to really observe here and see the, the de minimis spread between the two. So you've got your EBIT is basically your net income. Wonderful, wonderful set of circumstances. Goes to show how, how little their expenses are. If you take a look at their ability to grow that since 2016, I mean, you're looking at 57% uh, and 79% respectively for EBITDA and net income, once again, showing that they've been able to, to hold and expand their margins and grow that at a wonderful, wonderful clip. Now, all I wanted to point out here is, I think, unsurprisingly, I think the analysts are wrong. What it appears a lot of the software type modeling and analysts have done is they whoop, use this quarterly figure and extrapolated it out okay and yes this quarter was not as good as the same june quarter in 2022 because of the oil price um, if you look at the six months where you got a little bit of a longer runway actually 2023 is ahead of where the company was in 2022 so depending on how you want to play that whether you want to times that seven um, by four and um, you know four quarters in the year or whether you want to times um the six month period by two and get a rough annualized figure. I don't think it's going to make a hell of a lot of difference at the end of the day. I'm estimating somewhere around 450 million in terms of how much is going to flow through to shareholders. And, and that's, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. So you know where I get this next number from, because depending on which analyst you read, it might be different. It's simple as that. Uh, okay. Doke. So I've broken this all the way down to the per share level. Cause I know you guys love it. And makes it, it makes it easier. So EBIT and net income per share, what I expect um, at the end of this year. And no, it's not an, an error that the net income is higher than the EBIT because once again, it has to do with um, you know addbacks and what is a cash expense and what is not a cash expense and what is an interest expense um, that can be um, 
deducted and added or not added to the rest of the expense column. Okay, it's it's not a worry as you can see how close the two are on the, the previous chart I showed. What kind of multiples am I going to use? So if we look at um, dividend yield, which is what I'm interested in, I want to use this dividend play growing over time. I'll write options on it where I think that might add some value, help me to get um, some extra yield or free up some premium to buy more shares in a down uh, a downturn. EBIT, EBITDA multiples of 12. Seems very, 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 very reasonable uh, for a royalty company of this quality. Franco Nevada, you'd be paying 25, um, 20 minimum, 20, 25, up, to, up into the 30s. Um, yeah. Um, so that's what I've done here. I've applied a 10 multiple to the net income. Would I be happy to get a 10% income yield on buying this particular business? The answer to me personally is yes. And uh, would I be happy with an 8% EBIT yield? Yes, um, no, no question about it. So here's the, uh, here's the deal. So in addition to that, you've also got the call option on the acreage. So this is what they're expecting to make. But what happens if the oil price just goes through the roof? And depending on their sub agreements and their types of royalties, you would expect their you would expect their royalty take to massively increase. And as we saw before, ninety percent of uh, that revenue is going to drop is going to drop straight to the bottom line. So that's uh, for me is exactly what I'm looking for in this type of inflationary environment. It's really coming home, guys. People are feeling this. Um, I've been banging on about it for three bloody years. Finally, people might be paying attention. I don't know. Anyway. $23.40 roughly is what, I'm, uh, is what this little matrix would suggest, um, which would give you maybe a 30% upside in the equity. You get your dividend. Uh, and if you want to do uh, some options trading around it, you probably bump that um, upside up a little bit as well. If I extrapolate this out a little further, oop, not the uh, <laughs> not my not my video, but the, um, the EBITDA and the income, what I've done, I've extrapolated EBIT, net income, using very conservative, very, very, very conservative growth rates, very conservative terminal rates, uh, as in terminal multiple rates. And because if you look through, as I showed you, the thing was in 40, uh, was was 45% uh, CAGR growth for the EBITDA in, in the 70s for the net income. So a base case of 15, I think you'd have to agree that's pretty damn, um, pretty damn reasonable and conservative. In addition to which, I've just gone straight into the, the one here and using uh, my required rate of return, which is 20% as the discount rate. So you could then use the weighted average cost of capital and then you'd have, um, obviously that would make this number here even higher, the number at which you could afford to buy the shares. I've just done my uh, my return that I want. What pro At what price, what is the maximum price that I can afford to pay for this modeling to work out? And for me to get a 20% return uh, on the investment without worrying about options or reinvesting dividends or anything like that, okay? So this is the matrix I've got. At the current share uh, count, you've got uh, my base case at 60% probability, bull case at 20% probability, bear case at 20%. And let's remember these uh, extremely conservative uh, numbers, multiples uh, in terms of growth rate and multiple, and the discount rate is through the roof. So what this is suggesting is if you wanted to, you know, the maximum you could afford to pay if this all works out and is true and correct, which is obviously it's going to be off um, to some degree, you can pay no more than $29.75 if you want a further two-thirds margin of safety, which really doesn't apply to this because I've used the 20% discount rate. But anyway, even if you did that, uh, I put it in here to show you could afford to pay up to $19.60 for this thing. Um, I don't, yeah, that's, that's incredible uh, in my eye. So management, obviously they've done a very good job. It's a very good business model. These guys here are all in the executive suite. So Tom Carter is the CEO. He owns nearly 7% uh, of the company and just a tiny little uh, 257 million. So I believe Mr. Carter is incentivized um, to ensure the ongoing well-being of the company. Uh, wonderful, wonderful um wonderful set of circumstances for me when I see that when the CEO has a quarter billion dollars worth of um, skin in the game that's what I want to see okay so 
Last chart here today is just the price action. Uh, obviously, you've had COVID lows, okay? So May, April, May, 2020. Um, I, uh, we all wish we had more money to go back in time and to buy the thing there. Um, but anyway, if you look at the oil situation before we had all this mess mess up on the, on the supply side, uh, really come home to roost. This was trading at around today's uh, today's price levels. Think about everything that's happened in the oil market since then. Think about the SPR. Think about um, the geopolitical disruptions we've seen. Think about um, the gas to oil switching with gas becoming going through the roof last year. Think about how hard it is to use um, to any anything else in terms of transport or particularly chemical plastics is oil, uh, oil and gas. And, and so it looks like, oh, you only got back um, back to the beginning, but the oil market is just getting thinner and thinner and thinner on the supply side. And this thing still trades at the same price. And whilst its valuation has uh, gone up, the management have, uh, have done that. So uh, I'm holding some straight equity. I'm trading options around this um, I haven't traded it in the options maverick yet um, but when the market gives me a price because that's purely trading for income uh, as an insurance business in my other portfolio uh, I'm trading it to get cheaper entry points trading uh, options to get leverage on upside and trading options to, to increase the yield because uh, this is one thing that uh, I want to own and get more and more exposure to okay that's it guys uh, I hope you're all doing very well just on another note, if you're not on the Discord channel um, in the off Options Mavericks, jump on there. That's another bonus you get. And if you think this is all too hard and you just want to allocate some funds and have me manage them essentially via copying my portfolio on eToro, uh, you can obviously do that. Very, very small a minimum. It's like 200 bucks minimum. So if you just want to put a little bit in there for the longer term, um, yeah. It's me managing the portfolio of these types of businesses. So if you like this style, check it out. If you have any comments, questions, uh, or concerns, uh, hit me up by email on the comment section. Otherwise, I look forward uh, to seeing you in another video in another edition of the ROI Monthly. Take care, guys. Bye.